So as soon as I put the screen share on, go, hey, Professor Beck. Um, all right. So what we're doing today is um, we've spent time from the very beginning. We talked about a paradigm shift um, from ancient to modern to contemporary. And on the ancient one, I emphasized Aristotle's virtues, but I tied them into the United Nations and to the capabilities model so that right away you could get, there's a connection between ancient and contemporary. And so when you're developing your own model of a healthy psyche for women, you don't have to throw anything out if you don't want to, you definitely can, <laughs> but I'm not making you throw anything out. I'm just showing you that you could apply this in a way that's gender free, right? Doesn't bias, or you could end up applying it in a way that's deliberately gendered, or you could end up thinking that you're gender free and you're not. Um, so the theme for today, last time we did humanism and I do want um, students who didn't present last time, I will call on them to present this time, but I think I'll start out with this time and then we'll go backwards. And when the students are presenting backwards, they might be able to recognize something that they hadn't noticed about the readings in humanism and that they hadn't planned to bring up. Because the process of assigning you these things, the order that I assign them is for you to start, is for me to present them as viable, respectable. Uh, I say some of you could agree with this. Any of the positions I present are still alive and well. And, and there are people who still use them. And um, that's their worldview. But um, especially today, we're going to talk about how those worldviews get corrupted by uh, patriarchy. So that was the main theme today was that all these people we thought were our allies, right? I wrote about the capabilities model in my paper. I used it as my model. I used Aristotle as a model. And then the article today explains how Nussbaum herself went into developing countries with her model and she misapplied it. And so well-intentioned Western women are going into developing countries and they're messing up in terms of how they try to make developing countries less gendered and less patriarchal. And a lot of that bias is basically class-based. It's also gender, um, there's also gender issues, but the Western women might have good intentions or they might have ulterior motives, either one, but Post-colonial feminism is saying, I don't care what your intention was. This is not working. <laughs> and so that's what I want each of you to um, react to. And I'm excited, right? Because I like to teach this material to the women in those countries, which I've only, you know, recently been able to do. So before I was always teaching it to women in rural Arkansas or men and, and it was different. So I am going to um, call on you. Let's see. Let me just start out by stopping the share. Well, 
So this is the article. I hope you read it. And um, we'll go over the outlines after you speak. So there's the outline. And then there was an outline on another article about uh, ethical absolutism and ethical relativism. But right now, I'm just going to call on each of you for what, what you wrote as your response. OK? So now, what have you got? Sorry, sorry, Professor. Is that the last class response or uh, for today class? Uh, actually, we'll start up today. Good question. Uh, uh, today, I come to the reading, right? What? I come to the reading. I mean, uh, yes, like uh, the outline and the article that you gave. You couldn't get to it? No, no, no. I already, I, I mean, about those two, right? We had to, I, I know how to present this. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was, I, I chose the one that double shift, eight hours at home and eight hours at job. But here I mentioned about the work different between women and men, because it, uh, it is the way they make uh, the uh, women a healthy psyche by working more hours than men. In my society, they have seen uh, mostly men go to work and the women are as a housework at home. And they also have to go to work together with their husband or their father or something else. But they have, after they are working uh, far, after they come, then come back from work, first they have to uh, take a responsibility to host what again. So it is the way that make an equal uh, and imbalanced working between men and women. So they have seen mostly women and they are naked so much because of their stress, because they have to work. If we look here fully according to their work, they have to more they have to work more than men. That is the way they make them unhappy. And then the other the, the other point is I choose about productions. Women are known as the world productions, the other one who like if like produce uh, people because they are the ones who give birth and they're making more people, but they are uh, uh, like they are treated as uh, proletariat. So it is an equal treatment with this trade woman life because like X example, I just give an example. Most of the mostly people are getting so many wives but they do not want uh, they do not want daughter instead of son. They want mostly uh, their chair are uh, male, not female. And that the if uh, their wife uh, give birth with a female child, and they they hurt their wife or um, burden to their daughter, and that it is the way that. Um, make the woman a happy life. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so the problem of the double shift. Um, oh yeah, okay. And so what I was gonna say also was that women are under a lot of stress, right? Because of the double shift, because they do proletariat type of work, because they're under all this pressure if they don't have sons, because their husbands marry, uh, you know, somebody else. So that's true. And so then the question is, um, because your research paper is going to be about some way that psychology or psychiatry is actually practiced. So yeah, women disproportionately are depressed or mentally, you know, unstable because they're under all this stress. So 
what about those therapies? First of all, do they, are, do they have access to the therapies? Second of all, are the therapists men or women? <laughs> Third of all, do the, do the, does the discipline of therapy acknowledge that the reasons for the stress are the way the society is set up? And so just having a therapist isn't going to help you unless you know, you change the way the structures are. So that's why in this philosophical psychology class, I just teach, you know, about all the things that affect people's psyches and how they can have a strong psyche rather than just how the Western model of therapy, which the Western model really presupposes that the external conditions are not the major cause, right? It's relationship issues or something like that. So what I know of therapy, right? It's your relation to your parents or your siblings or something, but it's not like this whole systematic historical situation. And, um, it's, it's nice if women get a therapist to talk to, but in order for women to get a healthy psyche, it's, there's a way more than that that needs to be changed. Um, does that make sense to you now? Uh, I didn't really get it, Professor. <laughs> okay. So yeah. if women are under stress, you're explaining yes, why. Yes, yes. Mm -mm. If, if a woman wants to go to a therapist because she mm. has stress, um, yes, that's nice. But the therapist, if they pretend as if they can help her very much when she still is living under all these conditions, then you know <laughs> it's it's a Western privileged woman model of what it takes to alleviate stress does that make sense so is that means professor and they should find other way to be out of this stress like that yeah. well it's just um yeah that you have to change the economics yeah yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah i got <laughs> does it yeah that's no Does that make some sense to you? Yes, Professor. Okay. Yeah. And so, again, I'm sure I wasn't clear, but when you write your research papers, okay. you, you can think about what those articles say, you know, about how to do therapy and whether the articles ever include, you know, the sort of historical and economic and political, all the really systemic problems over and above just relationship problems. Does, does yes. that make sense? I think I get in. <laughs> you know, I to... right. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, therapists, some of them are existentialist therapists, Freudian therapists, Jungian therapists this therapist, that therapist, but almost all of those presuppose a certain amount of privilege and education. Um, so that's what I want to keep you to keep in mind as you do your research about um, the different types of therapy, whatever you do your research paper on, you could ask, is there a bias here? just like the global feminist bias. Is there a class bias or not, right? Yeah. Okay, so um, let's see. I guess, I don't know if you guys have the same screen that I have, but I guess I'll go to Maywish, even though she came more recently, just because I wanna make sure I get, I call on everybody. So go ahead, Maywish. Are you there? Well, maybe not. 
Okay, Ratika, go ahead. Okay. Um, Fardeen. Oh, so Ratika is going to write on the chat. Okay. Um, so what I'll do is if you write on the chat, I'll save all the chat ones till I finish with all the ones that I can actually talk. And then I'll check the chat and we can go through those. Um, Fardeen. Can you hear me, Professor? Yes. Um, so one of the things uh, that stood out to me from the reading, uh, here's a quote, post-colonial feminists concerned themselves primarily with econom economic and political issues, stressing that women's oppression as members of formerly colonized people often exceeds their oppression as a woman per se. Um, so many formerly colonized countries still face a lot of economic and political issues that are connected to colonialism um, in places uh, where people are struggling to simply survive gender equality doesn't necessarily seem to be high on the priority list for so many members of the community um so i read this in an article for another course and i can't remember the article's name right now but um so there i read that a lot of the time women um uh, put aside their concerns for gender equality because they feel like um they need to wait before they can demand in increased gender equality until their communities as a whole see political um, see their political and economic circumstances improve so they they feel like they need to wait until they can do that and um, yeah it seems like in these communities uh, it's harder sometimes it's harder to draw attention to gender equality and that's why it, it just uh, sort of goes on without seeing improvement and it kind of reminded me of um, the writer of Nomad. So I was thinking about her. So she's from Somalia and Somalia was previously colonized. So she connects the sexism she um, experienced to Islam. But I still, I wonder that if the political issues in where she was from, if, uh, if things were more stable, would she have experienced a different kind of Islam? Because um, yeah, maybe people's outlooks and their worldviews would have been less extremist if their circum circumstances were, um, yeah, if they were in a more politically stable place. Yeah, I was just thinking that. Okay. And then even though she brought up her family a lot, it was a family that had lived under that kind of uh, situation. Plus, um, there are plenty of Muslims in the United States who just don't think of Islam that way, right? Yeah. So it was surprising that she she just drew the line, you know? Mm -hmm. Like Islam can never be non-gendered. And actually, um, Aurora wrote a really long paper against that. So that's interesting. Um, Okay, Aisha, what did you, what did you get? Hello, Hello Professor. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so what, uh, okay, one of the things I, I would like to say is, as um, in this book, we saw that they talked about the widowed women in India, they kind of uh, broke their barriers. And um, I'd like to say in in our culture, um, there are like uh, the classism you have said, it's always here. And the women, uh, they actually, even if someone is showing, um, showing them to uh, think out of the box, like break the stereotypes or do your, I mean, live life to the fullest, but they may not be, um, they may not be interested to, uh, you know, um, except that calling, they are kind of uh, like, they're happy with their norms and their stereotypes. They would like to be in their own areas. And yeah, that's what I'm thinking. And some of them actually accepts that um, 
enlightenment and they move forward towards life. I mean, they are taking the challenges and um, proceeding towards their life. And I feel like it's a, uh, it's a sign of healthy psyche as they are kind of um, accepting some challenges and facing them. And for others, those who are just staying inside the norm, the stereotypes, for them, they are thinking that they are actually in a healthy psyche mode. I, I don't know, but in for them, but for like an universal way of thinking, it's not. Yeah, that's it. Right. Okay. And then the question is, how should women relate to each other, right? Should, should women in a developing country, the conservatives and the progressives, should they criticize each other or should they just respect each other, right, and move on? Um, okay, so that's an interesting question. So I feel like for, um, uh, okay. It's, it's very critical to answer, Professor, but it's like sometimes we need, not sometimes, always we need to respect each other to uh, like have a peaceful situation. Otherwise, you know, civil war will <laughs> erupt. So, and after that, and sometimes you can say about like the awareness and everything, uh, someone can enlighten the women or, but I don't know what will happen. I have no answer actually. <laughs> Well, yeah, I think you could just say, uh, you know, I disagree, but as long as you don't hinder me, right? As long as you don't make it harder for me to move forward, right? When women start undermining each other. Um, yeah, that's true. Yeah, either with gossip, you know, emotional or um, all the way to sabotage or forced marriages or you know they just shouldn't harm each other and um they should support each other i think does that make sense asia yes professor it is um let's see um i'm gonna try to go with the students new chat Yes, Professor. So what I wanted to point out was, um, there is a, I want to quote something. From, uh, so here it's mentioned that many third world women are more concerned about political and economic issues than sexual issues. That is true because uh, we have huge problem even on the issues related to legalities. Uh, for example, just some days ago, the legal reform was made to keep no option to comment on a woman's character in sexual assault trials. So we are that far behind that when a woman uh, goes for casing a file against any sexual assault or any rape, uh, the ca character is questioned first. The, ca uh, the uh, investigation is done on the character of the woman and then if it's seen that okay fine there is no issue with that so they go uh, they proceed with that so any sex worker for example will not even be able to file a case so that's where we are in the issue of equality or feminism so obviously um, in terms of achieving equality and the movement of feminism it's different in developing countries and uh, from the western uh, countries and even I feel that when I am having conversations with my friends or anyone from my family, because <coughs> um, since I uh, go to AVW where there are people from so many countries and also I follow um, so social media pages where which are um, from Western authors. So I think I, 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 I see feminism um, from more of a lens of a Western perspective. So well, that is why whenever I talk about the concerns, most people are like, give reactions like, this is not even a problem. There are many other problems in the world. Why are you just uh, bothering about this? And that really pinches me. I'm like, <laughs> how does it make sense? If there are many problems in the world, how does that um, 
uh, how does that tell you to stop bothering about some problems because there are other problems so yeah, yeah we it's actually different uh, we uh, we tend to focus more on political and social issues yeah focus really matters and keeping things in perspective is really important um but that's why having empathy listening to other people is important and i'm not sure that social media is good at listening um i don't know because i never go on it but it's so easy just to make pronouncements you know it's so much easier than to have a dialogue um anyway so oh i did want to point out that actually the united states might be a lot more backward than you think for example um women in, in legally in 1994 women could go to court and claim that their husband raped them and he would be punished for it so that was 1994. the thing is 38 states out of 50 states passed laws saying, yeah, but he'll get amnesty. <laughs> he'll be forgiven instantly. So basically, in 38 states, women can get married women. Uh, the husband can do whatever he wants. And he'll never get in legal trouble. So, so that, you know, that's just to say, and also I think in trial, I don't know if a woman's character can be brought up or not, but even if technically it can't, the lawyer can do it, and then the other lawyer will object, and then the judge will say, okay, objection sustained, but he's already said it. Does that make sense? And the jury, you know, the judge will say, okay, jury, you're not supposed to think about that. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so there are these uh, things where technically, legally, it might be a certain way, but the culture, the culture of patriarchy is so powerful that it's way beyond what's in the laws. Um, does that make sense to you, Nuchat? Yes, Professor. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, let's see, Fat oh, Fatima was going to go on the chat, right? Let me see. Um, where are we here? Supti. Um, okay, Amal. Okay. Let's see, Ritika. Okay, here's Ritika. Many factors that pull women behind. Uh, religion is one of them. Okay, so Ritika thinks uh, religion is, you know, a negative force in women's desire to develop. Um, okay, so she can, you know, you can give your evidence, plenty of evidence. Um, and then, let's see, Aurora you know, gave a long paper saying that Islam, that Muhammad really was ahead of his time and there's no reason, you know, to re for a woman to reject Islam. So I, my job isn't to tell you what to think, um, but that's where the reading for today, the women really, Either they didn't think they were telling these women what to think or how to think, or they did think so. <laughs> but either way, it was a lot more colonial than um, I hope that I am. Um, you know, I try to self-correct, but still I catch myself. Um, and I also don't want the women in the class to you know get down on each other like as long as you have good reasons 
um, and you can move forward. So, for example, um, one of you might decide religion's the problem, and then 10 years from now, you get in a situation and you think, well, maybe it's not. Maybe I can work cl more closely with these religious women because they can go convince these other women and I can't convince them, right? So all of a sudden religion becomes an ally. On the other hand, someone your age might say, no, religion is, Muhammad was not sexist or it was forward looking. But then she, 10 years from now, she hits a brick wall and it's like, uh, I think Islam is the problem, right? So there's just so much out there for 50 years of experience. I don't know why I would have some agenda. Um, and I, I also don't know why the Western women go out there into developing countries with their agendas and don't realize that that isn't, that isn't the way to do it. The way to do it is to listen and then get into a discussion, I think. Um, but that's, again, up to each of you to decide what you think. Um, so Jana Tool was going to go into the chat. Um, Amal, are you able to connect? Yes, I'm finally connected. Okay. Uh, so, okay, I want to comment on uh, feminist moral uh, relatives. The, uh, uh, that, that quote that like want to respect difference, but they reserve the right to judge uh, which difference among individuals or groups should be respected. I'll mention something that I noticed from conversations with women here. Um, it was like about uh, how a woman who is like a bit different because she decided to be independent and, you know, get her own house, get her own job and live by herself. So she is judged and, you know, uh, perceived uh, like there is false, uh, the people make, make up false stories about her just because she decided to live alone. So I think the culture, as you said, the culture is uh, a, a big challenge. Also women judging other women is a big challenge because like, it's not something that's not normalized in the culture, but they cannot accept it, but rather, you know, talk, talk uh, for, like about this woman in, uh, in an, a good way and, uh, yeah, that, that's the, the thing that I want to convey that, uh, yeah, people like uh, they are ex expected to stay in their family's home just to like, just for their dignity, because being independent me meaning that you're risking your dignity. Yeah. Okay. I just read a whole book about how patriarchy overcame goddess worship. In, in the West, I think it was maybe in the world, but I mean, oh my God, the damage that they did to women, but especially if a woman lived alone, she was a witch, right? And there's all this witch burning and pouring hot lead down their throats. And it was really, it's only been recently that very many women have lived alone. And, um, I mean, I didn't think it was a big deal at all. But after I was divorced, I live alone, you know? And these people would say this weird stuff to me. They'd say, you travel alone? Like, <laughs> I mean, really? And it, it's all this projection, like just because they've never done it. They can't imagine that it's okay to do. Or they, aren't you afraid when you go blah, blah? It's like, no. Um, why should I be? I'm, a, you know, it's very ironic uh, what people fear and how people imagine other people's lives. But I do think that problem about women alone is, I, yeah, I hope your generation just gets over it. I mean, you're going to have to make a leap, right? Because, yeah, and I, AUW is just trying to give you a sense, right, that you are independent. But 
you might want not want to tell certain people. <laughs> uh, this one student, students have told me that they come home after being at AUW and they, like this one girl wanted to major in PPE rather than public health. And her mother said, you can't go back to that school if you major in PPE. <laughs> Because philosophy is naughty. Okay, so um, it's it's a long haul, but I think you guys can do it. Um, okay, let's see. Um, where are we now? Um, Isabel. Have you got something? Nope. Uh, yes, Professor. Okay. I guess you can hear me. Sorry, I was fixing the microphone. Okay. So, um, here I want to talk about something of a uh, woman get a double job in their lives, especially for the women who are working. I mean, getting out of job. So. They, they are getting a job outside, however, because they have to do another job inside their house. So this actually also can lead them to be not in a healthy psyche, just because um, most of the time, their partners do not like uh, have a cooperation with them to work the same as how they do every day. Or, and, you know, even the husband also, have to work outside, but when they come home, they can get a rest nicely. And even they don't even think about how can they help their, their partners to actually uh, do the housework and stuff like that. So that is the also, uh, it's a good thing for women to get a job outside. However, also it will put them in trouble as well because they have to do a double job. So they might not be in, in a healthy uh, mind and body because of, this issue and because of their partners do not want to share uh, the housework together with them. So yeah, I think this is very, uh, I mean, very important for, especially for everyone, especially for men to think about this, this way to, you know, on how to develop the families or living in a healthy life um, by working together or cooperate with the partners and the family so that yeah everyone can stay healthy yeah did you notice anything about how the way western women um imposed their worldview onto women in developing countries um i didn't get the professor that was the main theme in that article was that they thought they were helping out these women but actually they were they had a bias. Um, they didn't pay attention to the class issues. The fact that women work, they're the proletariat. The jobs that women get when they're outside is Western corporations hire them at the lowest levels with the lowest salaries, the worst working conditions, and that that's part of it too. Um, yeah. Okay. Did you have any, did you want to comment on that at all? Um, do you mean about the salary that women get it, uh, when they work outside? Right. It's not just the double shift. It's what they're doing and what ah, they're I see. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it happens. It happens as well. I mean, um, they don't actually really get the... Um, fair paid and stuff like that so yeah especially um i had i have heard about a uh, woman who are working at, here in bangladesh who are working in garment factories so most of them are not getting fair paid however you know they even work there in the garment factories also they have to go and work at home and taking double uh, jobs every single day this actually not leading them to to be healthy at all 
So also people are not always like uh, this issue is not only happening in Bangladesh. I think happen um, in most of the countries, especially in developing countries. And then they are thinking that um, it's okay. I can get a low paid. Uh, make sure I get a job. I, I mean, it's true that you you get a job. However, it's not fair. Sometimes they have to work uh, over time. Like they supposed to work at eight hours, but I mean uh, for eight hours. But um, because the the company or the boss are not doing uh, of what the the rules are saying so even if they work long hours but they also still cannot get the fair paid and stuff so i think also this is a very big issue for women too okay i have a question for people um i used to sew and i really love fabrics textiles and so i love to buy you know batik in indonesia and in bangladesh you know they have a lot of textiles but the trouble is those are all made by women in sweatshop sort of conditions or a lot of them are so should i boycott that and not buy it and then they don't have uh, a job exactly professor i have the same thinking with you know, how you think about it because you know they they don't get the fair pay However, the, the stuff that they are making and then they, their company are like exported to uh, other countries and then how the price that they sell is very big. So it's not fair for, for them, you know, it's a they hard work. So the question is, should I buy it or not buy it? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Professor, I also asked the same question like that when I'm, I'm thinking about this kind of issues. So. Well, I, don't know. I think that in yeah. developing countries, economic issues are so intensive than the other issues that um, buying would aid some value to yeah, uplifting women. Well, then I went to the Brock. So Brock, you know, has has shops where they just sell the stuff that's been uh, made by people who have good working conditions and all that it costs way more like no middle class bangladeshi person so i mean i go in there and there's all these elites and all these rich folk and then i think wait a sec do i want to be walking around with a, a dress on that lets everybody know i can afford this and you can't do you understand like what am i supposed to do does everybody understand that? Like, how come there isn't some, <laughs> something in the middle, right? Yeah. Oh, gal. <laughs> I never figured that out, so I didn't buy very much. And then COVID came, and <laughs> I had to go to out of the country. But the next time I come, you can give me some advice about what to do, because I love textiles, you know, and I love... I, I like it because to me, human beings do not live by bread alone. Like they need art, they need visually pleasant um, uh, dishes and tables and clothing, you know, they need that and it makes them happier. And women have done that, but now it's gotten you know, corrupted by international capitalism, and I, I don't know what to do. But you can give me advice when the time comes. Um, Pooja, what about you? Did you come up with Hello, something? Professor. Go ahead. Uh, I was, uh, I mean, listening to all the comments, and many of the comments were really did uh with the women uh and it was similar to our country as well and when it comes to like um, like work working women in some uh sectors and uh relating it with the families issue and like family support i guess uh comparing to the past it has been changed but like still women are suffering uh, to have like 
uh, support in the family when a girl or a woman goes out outside to work and uh, she she is questioned every single night or like evening if she comes late or like uh, she has to answer a lot of questions like why you were late what were the reasons some uh, i mean like you were walking so late night and it feels like i mean if a man comes in a similar way but like a family never asks the same question to her so i was like why there is always women who has to answer a lot of questions related to uh, just not coming home at exact time that a family wants so i feel bad always but like it's, it, even in my family for example if my brother go out and if, if he uh, goes uh, out for any hours he is never questioned on that like where you have been with whom you have been but like if our my sister and i go out and if we even take the permission from family and if we are late for a while or like for example 30 minutes or one hour we are always questioned like where you have been with whom you have been give me the phone number or something like and it it is always so pissed professor when i have to do this and i have to always make people understand that why there is inequality between my brother and sister or me so that's my point professor it makes unhealthy uh thinking as well when it comes to like this kind of issues comes to our home and even yeah. parents doesn't understand the point that we actually want to say yeah that's a problem and then i mean there's the other immediate stuff like child marriage right um child marriage is a big problem but should western women come in there and start you know throwing their weight around and say we got to stop this and you guys got to arrest these people or yet is that the way to do it because it is a huge problem i think people will agree but how the heck what do you do <laughs> uh yes, professor like for example talking about child marriage is like it was my my uh, mother got married at the age of 16 and my grandma got married at the age of 13 my mother wants uh, my mother and my grandpa wants me to get married before 18 so this was not possible i'm already 22 plus and then my grandpa is always like you are already old and there will be no one to get married and it feels like so uh, <laughs> like I, I i feel like i can't make them understand okay but like this is the issue in developing countries like you have to get married in the early if not there won't be anyone to get married or like you won't get a good husband something like that yeah so here's the question should the western women come in there and tell you what to do or should you say no i think that there's enough people the natives right the citizens of the country there's enough of them that they can speak to their own people to try and change it. But then people will say that's because they've been brainwashed by Westerners, right? And they're just wannabe Westerners. <laughs> and it's like, it's so complicated. But I think at least the Western women ought to be aware that it's complicated and they ought to be careful. So it sounds like they came in there without a lot of reflecting, right? Without understanding that just because you have good intentions, that doesn't mean you're actually gonna accomplish anything. Um, does that make sense to you, um, Pooja? Or yes, Professor, like for example, if, if we try to uh, convince over here because of the cul culture and the traditions they are believing in i guess it will be difficult to make them understand at this point but like moving uh, to that like our generations people are something like some are like they have understood everything in a better way and like they are uh, going in a positive way i think it will be get better in upcoming generations for sure like for not with our parents or grandpa but like the upcoming generation 
have some good positive attitudes with that. I mean. Okay. So yeah, Fatima in the chat brought up this other, this is another good one because you know, you can talk about economics and politics, but then you end up talking again, like something like birth control, right? Because if you have too many kids, or you have an unplanned kid, you really get set back. So she said in Islam, temporary methods of birth control are permissible, but permanent methods are not, unless there's a good reason like illness. Islam does not make having more children compulsory, but it's encouraged. Uh, I think this idea is corrupted and people do not do family planning. I mean, if you do want any kind of career that uses your talents, then you do have to have, you, I mean, having unexpected kids is make, really throws a wrench in. Does that make sense? I mean, it does in the West too, but it would especially do so in a, if you're in a developing country. So um, the fact that it's not encouraged, right? And, um, you know, there's pressure. Do you guys have pressure to have a big family? Or, I don't know. No, you... it, de it depends on the individual uh, family, region, everything, professor. Uh, and also this thing itself that this happens in Islam and this country is an Islamic country. So this issue is the biggest issue. I think this approach itself is not helpful. Also, and um, I have a disagreement with the uh, victim and savior approach towards feminism in like the way you said <coughs> Westerners coming up with the theories. So it's not very helpful because uh, people in the East for example, specifically, if I take example of Pakistan and the history of Pakistan, they still feel that uh, when uh, the Western people, they come into with all these ideas and everything, it's just another form of colonizing them. Yes. So initially it was economic, so the companies, and now it's colonizing them with ideas. So no matter how good their intention is, the uh, result is such this, that that they are still they still feel threatened in terms of their identity and which is very understandable because it might so this uh, i have always this question that how can we decide that who knows better so the individual life individual psychology it's very it's so individual to each individual that coming up with such a broad theory that oh this is the issue now we figured out so we know more so this is the issue and this is how we're going to solve it. I think that's a very theoretical and like very general approach to the thing than uh, closely understanding the issues for which I guess awareness in local level would be better. And uh, for example, even if you take example of Pakistan, economic issues and lack of education, I think they are greater issues than what the feminism in West is considering as issues. So before the emancipation of the woman from all these things, I think the economic uh, um, uplifting of women would be helpful than the ideological uplifting. Uh, that would help in the local level. And that's how I think it would be more effective in global aspect. Okay, good. I think, um... I think that's why, again, the notion of practical wisdom, right? Knowing what to do in a given situation that will promote flourishing, right? Yes. And so we're going to go back, right? I'm going to go back through Kant and these people and say, you know, is that too abstract? Because Kant didn't mention anything about context. And Augustine didn't mention anything about context. So that I will do that later on. But I think um, that's, again, why AUW, one of their missions is that you just put all these women together for a while and they just talk to each other, right? And you don't have any big ideologies. You just get to know people and, and you live your your life in this new environment you're having to make decisions and you're having to get advice or you know you just make it a dialogue 
And um, I think in this class, I try to assign things that disagree with each other and stuff so that you just have a dialogue and you don't, you know enough to know that you don't know, like you develop some intellectual humility <laughs> and, and you start to understand your biases, right? And class is a huge bias, is a huge problem. Um, in the US, class is bigger probably than gender because uh, educated women marry educated men and less educated women marry less educated men. So even in a developing country, um, there is this blindness that goes on. Um, anything else you wanted to say, Maywish? Um, I would also like to comment on sex trafficking and how disproportionately it affects women. And also, um, we should also question that to what extent the politics of each country, they are involved in helping women and the gender issues and everything. Because for example, in Thailand, they uh, make, I think dollar, it's mentioned dollar 30 billion something, uh, 3 billion out of sex trafficking and sex tourism. So it's a very complicated issue. And I think economic aspects, aspect plays a very key role in this. So if the government itself, it encourages all this prostitution, sex tourism, and then women get trapped in it. So do they really want to help women or is it all in documents if we look practically into these things? So yeah, these are things that we should practically be concerned about that to an extent each authority is playing role in keeping women in those uh, situations in which they are. Yeah, actually, I was on an airplane once, and I was sitting next to this guy, and I was going from Indonesia to um, Vietnam, and I said, oh, well, what brings you to Vietnam? He said, well, I'm going to meet with my friends for 10 days. We do this once in a while. Uh, we just go have a good time, and I was like, it occurred to me that this guy might be one of those sex traveling guys right because he just talked oh, he's obviously not going to say that but he just said well we just go and we have we drink you know and have fun but i mean for 10 days really so i'm just sitting there and i, I all of a sudden is like getting this really creepy feeling about this guy sitting. and professor in uh, you know one thing uh, which i feel really sad about so when we are in university, like the way now we are like in the academic life, we're discussing ideas and like we're very eager to explore new ideas and everything. And when you come out in the practical world, it's shocking. It's shocking because these things are very normalized. They're normalized to the extent that even at times you feel like, oh, maybe I was too much bothered, unnecessarily bothered about these things. And they're very normal. It gets the person to that point. So. I don't know, there should be a balancing line when even while we theoretically exploring these things in education institutions, we should also look into some practical solutions because when you go, we discuss all these things in a utopian state where we're like, no, no, this is how it should be. We are acting, like we're thinking very rationally. And then you go out and you see things that are very normalized. Then you seriously don't know how to react to those. And it, at times you just give up because they're so contradictory to each other that, yeah, I don't know how to react to these things. Well, one thing is, um, so in your research paper, you could talk about literally how therapy is actually conducted or how women study, you know, is the therapy gendered so that, you know, you don't even have the right right ideas and when you go to try to deal with people there's no connection right so and then the other thing about it is that while you're getting your education one of the main things is well what can i do like what do i want to major in and what do i anticipate doing and so that your ultimate goal is actually something boots on the ground right um and then also that you just develop friendships and those can help you stay sane. Yeah, and I would like to point out that instead of just fantasizing and fancying these big ideas, after the class and everything we learn, we should always think of some practical small level implication of these things. Otherwise, you 
go out with all the fancy ideas and nothing no nothing to see that how you're going to imply all those in the practical scenarios yeah that's that's right that makes sense um but i guess don't they call it gaslighting when somebody you know tries to tell you it isn't really there or something i don't know anyway i i understand that it gets normalized and it yeah you get it's hard it's hard um Ashlyn, what would you like to say? Um, yes, Professor, thank you. <clears throat> if I just start by commenting on your question to Pooja that whether the uh, Western women should come to our countries and kind of tell the, implement their ideas. So uh, Mahavish already uh, you know, touched, the, uh, touched that area very clearly. So I just wanted to tell, uh, as, as she told, even if the intention or how good the intention of the Western women would be, but it won't, it, it is not necessary that people will be taking it uh, in, in that 100% sense, which is totally understandable again as what she told. So I think if the natives themselves could think all of the issues that they are facing and they themselves could, you know, kind of uh, help the others to get out of the situation, that would be more understandable because uh, the natives, like, for example, if there is some uh, problem happening in my place, I can understand it from my cultural, cultural context perspective. Like I can um, uh, kind of figure out all the possible uh, outcomes which is going to happen if I tell this, but the, but a person from another cultural context may not be knowing all these things, the potential consequences, what will be happening when she, in, like when he or she implements their particular idea into another cultural context. So when natives or when the person who is living in the same cultural context come up with their ideas, which which actually can connect it with the, uh, which actually can convince the ideas of the people from the same cultural context, that would be more um, I guess that would be more practical and uh, easy for them to make a change other than people coming from another countries or cultural context to um, kind of sort the problems out. And that is one of the things I have, I wanted to reflect on. And I also wanted to say uh, the feminism and others, and it should be one of the one of the things that I found uh, interesting is that uh, there was this interview, a v interview which was happened in India, uh, like one of the celebrities. Uh, so the the interviewer asked the celebrity, "Do you believe in feminism? So what is feminism to you?" Then uh, the answer he gave is very interesting. So we we if feminism is. Is, is not something like that he told in a very positive way. Feminism is not something that we should consider in a bottom line because being born as a person, everyone should be treated equally. So if we get that particular idea, so I don't think this, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, a pseudo feminist ideas, I would say pseudo feminist idea would take place in, um, uh, would would get the area here and people would be co corrupted by the idea of feminism that others wanted to implement. So I guess the gender equality, uh, the gender equality is a big thing to be considered from the very beginning. So uh, for example, uh, when a person is born, I, I'm just telling about the ratio, like, uh, like the ratio of people, uh, gender uh, preference that they need actually. So but what we have seen is that when uh, when, a, when a woman is getting pregnant, the majority of them, I'm not sure whether it is happening now also, they, they need a boy. I'm not sure why, why is that happening. So that is a, a disproportionality of gender that is that is again going on. So if we if we could consider from the very grassroots level and, and also treating women as an emotional being and not considering them completely as a human uh, is also another issue that I found. Uh, for example, yeah, um, for example, uh, consider if women is having some mental health issues or if women is going through a depression or something like that, they are told, they are told okay, uh, you can you can actually uh, manage all those things because you are a mother you are a sister you can you can kind of uh, you know con that is that is one of your good abilities so they are told that being emotional is a very good abilities you can actually have so i, I guess these ideas uh, of women being treated you know over glorifying their womanhood or motherhood 
these all are problematic uh, to you know corrupt the idea of uh, good feminism i would say professor um, if yeah, actually in the us the, the students i ask them what do you associate feminism with and it, it's really awful right because they assume that capabilities that opportunities for equality are there's no problem and so they associate it with sexual promiscuity um and just general degeneracy right and so i'm not a feminist these and I say, do you want to be able to go to college? Yeah. Do you want to be able to be treated equally in, when you apply to grad school? Do you want to be treated equally when you apply for a job? Do you want to be treated, you know? Oh, of course, of course. And I'm not a feminist, right? It's exactly. I guess people being corrupted just by the word feminism because it's it's connected to the term feminine. They they kind of. Uh, think that okay feminism is something that means like only women in like in the society like enhancing women uh, like giving importance for women than the other gender something like that so I, I i actually see how people are corrupted just by the term feminism it's like uh as you have already told i also asked some people do you believe in feminism then they're like oh, I, I mean are you a feminist then they're like no i'm not a feminist but I am actually, I'm asking them, the next question I ask them is that, do you believe in equality and do you believe treating equal to the other gender or something like that? Yes, I believe, I believe. Then I was like, both these things are the same. You you have to understand it first. I I just I just wanted to comment how people are being corrupted just by the term feminism because it, it it is connected to the term female or femininity. So yeah, that's some of the very grassroots level things that have to be changed. I guess, Professor, as you have already told. Well, I just point out. I say, who benefits when you think the word feminist means sexually promiscuous or degenerate? Who benefits from that, right? Yeah. Men, of course, powerful men, because then they don't have to change anything because of course, nothing is their fault. They're already totally virtuous and just, right? And yeah, the students don't get it. Even American students don't get it. Um, so uh, the other thing I was gonna say, right? So a woman gets depressed. So on the one hand, you say, oh, but you're emotional and you, you can handle that. On the other hand, they say, oh, well, that's because you're too emotional and you're not rational enough. And so if you just get rational. And of course, it's never because they have a double shift or they get treated like dirt by their husbands or nobody listens. It's never because of that, right? If, you know, if a guy were treated the way these women were treated, they get mad, right? And depression in a lot of ways is just anger turned inward, right? So women aren't allowed to get angry, so they get mad. I mean, they aren't allowed to get mad, so they get depressed, right? But of course, it's never, it isn't tied to the very things where it's appropriate to get angry. And if you can't get angry, it's appropriate to be depressed, right? Because the alternative is to accept it right may wish to just comply right become complicit and um so i remember you know i suppose i might have been diagnosed depressed if i got to somebody but i just thought i'm not going to get myself labeled because it's not my fault right it's the patriarchy that's doing this and i refuse to get identified as having some kind of mental illness because it my mental state is very appropriate for the way I'm getting treated. And that would never, you know, factor in, right? I would just, those questions they ask you about whether you're depressed, they never ask why, right? They never, it, it drives me nuts, right? Do you often feel sad? Well, yeah. What, you know? I mean, they don't ask you why. Well, because the situation in the world is pretty sad. Oh, I guess you're mentally healthy, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, it drives me crazy. Um, so 
And I also, I just want to encourage my students because yes, you know, make sure to distinguish between when you're feeling depressed for exactly the right reasons and it means you're really healthy. <laughs> right? right? Or, or it's, you know, you just feel like it's gotten to be too much. But don't ever let the world label you uh, for actually having an appropriate response to the way your capabilities are being hindered all the time, right? So, Professor, um, I just wanted to comment on one of the uh, another another cuttings that we have in the reading. So, women around the world are working to promote women's well-being and what makes it better and worse way to do this. So I just wanted to comment on that uh, idea of women being the slayers of women and women being the supporters of women itself. So what I find in my cultural context is that uh, so there are women who are trying to help women and try to enhance them from their situation that they are being uh, you know, kind of uh, put down into, but then there are also the women who are more privileged, like uh, who are privileged before, and and they they don't necessarily want to uplift other women. What I feel is that they 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 are also into this idea of patriarchy just because they are privileged and they have all the uh, facilities and things, but that doesn't mean that they're supporting the other women. They are kind of, uh, you know, uplifting the idea of patriarchy again, and they indirectly or directly, they kind of, um, the kind of attack the other women, uh, I would say, and they, they won't give any support to the others because they doesn't have the experience. What I have found is that women who already have an experience of being oppressed and who have come out from a situation, for come out from their comfort zone and uh, fought for their freedom, they actually uplift the other women. In that terms, I would say women support women, but there are cases where women are being the slayers of women itself. So that is the two other side when we consider women being the supporters and women being the oppressors. Uh, in the U.S., it's terrible. There are all these Trumpy women. Um, they can't get enough guns, right? They're just advertising. Yeah, AK-47. Yeah, I got one. It's great. I mean, they're just jumping all over each other to lick up to the men. It's really awful. And they, uh, they really say awful things about liberal progressive women. It's terrible. Um, but yeah, lack of empathy. That's where, again, I think liberal arts education is trying to help you understand a person, even though you can't, you didn't have those same experiences, but you learn how to identify with the person at, just as a human being, if you can, right? So for example, with Sojourner Truth, you could figure out how to make a connection there, right? And so just reading a lot of different stuff and a lot of different people and trying to figure out where you can make a connection and then also knowing when you don't know, right? When it's sort of beyond you. So yeah, that the, the liberal arts education literature and stuff like that is trying to get you, get practice in that, but also just the commitment that it's important, right? And so that it'll be something that you carry forward with you. Okay, Supti said she wanted to talk about secular humanism. Uh, in secular humanism, um, a philosophy that embraces reason, secular ethics, philosophical naturalism, while specifically rejecting religious dogma, supernaturalism, superstition. Uh, it posits that human beings are capable of being ethical without religion or belief in a deity. It does not assume that humans are either inherently good or evil, nor does it present humans as being superior to nature. Rather, the humanist life stance emphasizes the unique responsibility of facing humanity and the ethical consequences. Um, so she says, basically, I'm taking an ETHR course, which is based on secularism. I understand that every person has their rights, whether or not they're religious. Okay, good. Um, and that's good. I, I try to teach this course with keeping an open mind. 
so that the students who really want to be humanistic and religion, they can. Um, and the students who really want to be secular and humanistic, they can go there too. Um, so I, I, I like to, to let students decide, but no matter what, they can't just say, well, I haven't had experiences with that in, in my religion. They need to know that a lot of other women do, right? And it is in the name of religion. So that's that's what people need to understand. But that's fine, Supti. Um, I think we're going to take a break. And then after that, we'll go back to that humanism that we talked about. Although, I, no, wait, I still have Diana and Shahira. So after the break, Diana, did you want to talk about this article? Yes, Professor. Okay, so we'll start with Diana. And I think Shahira disappeared. And then we're going to go back to last time. And if you, those of you who didn't present last time, so be prepared to present either what you were going to present, or if you want to say, I was going to do that, but actually I've changed my mind or expanded my ideas, that's great. But I will try to give you a chance and then um, uh, summarize a little bit. I mean, just go over and remind you of what we've done and then think about how all of those positions could have been well-intentioned, but understood in a very sexist way. So you can rethink everything compared to how you were first presented with it. Okay, um, go ahead, take, um, why don't you take uh, 15 minutes and then, I'll, then you'll have some time to write your posts. Does that make sense? Um, okay, so go ahead and this is, so it'll be 45 minutes after the hour. We'll come back. All right. The most powerful aspects of patriarchy are the unconscious ones, you know? If men really knew how sexist the situation is, they'd probably get really mad. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, to change, I don't know. But they, they just don't know. It's unconscious. Um. Yeah, the same is true of race. I mean, when Black Lives Matter hit, there were these people, these nice Minnesota Scandinavian types saying, I didn't realize that I was sexist. Like, what? <laughs> what? You know, how could you, or racist? How could you not think of it? Or I didn't think about how much class affects the way I think about things, it's really, um, I don't know. It, it, but that's liberal arts education. You read a whole bunch of stuff from a whole lot of perspectives and it, it's trying to shake you out of that, make you aware so that you don't, so you're not so ignorant. So the word ignorance means to ignore, right? It, and not knowing the facts is one kind of ignorance, but most of it is just you're ignoring a lot of stuff because you're focused on something else. And so as long as you know that, that you have to ignore a lot, when somebody points out what you've been ignoring and says it's important that you've been ignoring this, that you're not offended by that, right? that you actually don't want to be ignorant. <laughs> um, anyway, so Diana, are you there? Or did you disappear? Yes, Professor, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, you're in the, my lower left hand corner. Okay, go ahead, Diana. Okay, uh, so I have uh, some points on the three points of the article. The first one was the political issue uh, about the woman issue. I can clearly see this in Afghanistan based on culture, based on religion, opinion, and because of uh, gender inequality, these things. So 
I don't see actually uh, the relation of women with the political, but people have brought out that women cannot be a leader. Even in Afghanistan, I can see that it is, it is uh, accepted by people that they don't allow women to be the judge in the court because they said that women are so emotional and they can uh, let go something in the court or in the, some cases because they are soft hearted. So might be that that's why. And the, some of the people can relate this to the religion basis that no, because of, I don't know, based on what opinion they said that the Islam has not allowed that. So I still didn't accept that. And, um, and, and still that is going on in Afghanistan. So they are relating these uh, politician uh, issues on women issues. And uh, today, fortunately, we have a lots of women in parliament, but they are still fighting with the female leaders because they are insulting them that you are women, stay in your limit. What this points mean that stay in your limit because you are a woman, you are not allowed to raise your voice. You're not allowed to raise your points. Still, these issues are going on. People have voted them. People have choose them uh, to be their leader. But still, those who are male, they feel superior. And uh, they think that no, women cannot lead. Women cannot be empowered. Women cannot be uh, self-determinant. This all, still, it's going on. And... Uh, Another point I want to mention where few people can be free, equal, and self-determining. And fortunately, fortunately, I have seen a lot of youth girls that they are independent. They can take their decision. They can, um, they can uh, stay against of everyone, even in the family and outside of the family, in the society, in classes, in university classes, outside everywhere they are standing on their own shoulder and they are not relying on anybody. Uh, even though they are not uh, uh, gaining money, they are not, they are not working, but still they have understood that we have the right. We can uh, be self-determinant, we can be uh, free, we can be uh, a single person. We cannot be rely on somebody else. I have this power. so they have understood that they are able to do what men can do. Even sometimes personally, I feel that I'm more superior than men and I can do more things that they cannot do. I am superior than them. I never think that they are superior than us because I see uh, when I'm looking to the male that they cannot do many things, but still we can do that. So we are superior. I am superior than them. And I stay against of lots of things, even in the family decisions and a lot of things. But because of culture, ethnicity, uh, religion, basis, opinion, this all, they, are not, they have made the strict rule on us that we should not be allowed. Or even in Afghanistan, I have seen there are some families that they cannot raise their voice. If they raise some points on social media, so again, a lots of points will come to them that why this should come to our uh, community because we have our own religion, blah, blah. They are relating a lots of the, a lots of the points which is not related to that point. That is not re uh, re related, that cannot be related, but still they, they are doing those things. And sisterhood, so one thing I wanted to say that if women want from their heart, so they can love each other, they can support each other, uh, no religion, no culture, no community, no ethnicity, nothing can uh, bother them that they should stop this all thing. Whatever happens, they will stay who they are if they want. That's my point. Thank you, Professor. Okay. All right, so one thing, I would like you all to think about is, yeah, the AUW sisterhood, right? That you yeah. bought each other, but also that you call out other AUW sisters if they act passive aggressively, right? If they mm -hmm. diss other women, 
right? Try to call them out and just get them to stop because it's so harmful, right? Women can do more harm to each other. Um, and then it just cripples them moving forward. So try to call them out on it, convince them, you know, get up. First of all, I think a lot of it's unconscious, right? Professor, can I say one thing in this sure. point? Sure. Uh, be, when I was in AW, so I was in, in, engaged with the people, with those who, those who were a bit aggressive and blah, blah. Uh, but one thing was coming to my mind firstly, that there are a reason. Might be that reason can be related to us, to our action, to our points, to our words. But there can, there is possibility that that is not, that is not related to us at all. There can be some basic reason that they have learned in their childhood, or there are some reason that they, that is not related to us, but that is related to her family or her emotion or her mood or anything. So at first we need to understand and give time to the opposite person that that can be comfortable with us, that she can share what was the reason. On that time we can decide that whether we are the blame person or not. And then we can have a very good relationship with that person. And we can uh, build a new bonding uh, with her that she can be more comfortable and share her points and she can be free and she can be in a good mental health. Okay, good. Okay, so Jana Tool said in her village, um, women are forced by their parents and relatives to get married. They're not allowed to go to university. They think education is not for women. Women will not have jobs, so education isn't important. Uh, she thinks this, John Atul thinks this type of thinking is wrong because if you want a, a good child, if you want to be a good mother, an educated mother is very important. Education is not just for a job. And an educated wife is also important. So that's what Mary Wollstonecraft said in that article. Um, I don't know, a few weeks ago. So I think that's true too. I mean, I hope most of you would agree with that. So let me go back to the outline here and make sure we covered everything. So we did cover this idea of um, the different issues, the, the different focus people have. Um, but freedom of choice, right? Choice to control your lives over your life and your bodies inside and outside the home. That's more immediate. And then this other stuff that's more systematic and structural, uh, historical, and needs changing at all these other levels. Um, let's see. Um, Okay, women shouldn't merely tolerate each other, right? They need to sort of come together in some meaningful way. Um, uh, let's see. An inequitable international labor system is a big problem. Um, okay, so the difference between the issues about reproduction, controlling technologies, and reproduction aiding technologies. Remember all that stuff? I mean, there was access to birth control, there's access to um, abortion, but there's also when women in developing countries are, or men are forced or super encouraged to get vasectomies, right? Um, or when obstetricians sterilize poor women and not wealthy women. Um, Okay, so, oh yeah, and the Soviet Union women are forced to get abortions because they don't have contraception. In China, there was a one-child policy and how so many, uh, there was female infanticide in India and China, plus all these ways to prevent women from having 
uh, daughters because they want sons. And then they get this huge imbalance between they don't have enough women to go around and then women get kidnapped or women get sold. Uh, you know, all this stuff. There, there are a couple words that uh, I'm going to say to you that should help you understand the power of language because there's a reality there that the killing of women because they're women, but there's no word for it. Even though there's millions of women every year, you know, female babies, uh, girls because of malnutrition, because the boys get fed or because of this and that. So there's millions of women that die because they're women, but we don't have a word for it. So the word is, there's two words, femicide or gynocide, right? G-I-N, gynecology, that's a Greek word for women. But if we had the word femicide or we had the word gynocide and we just used it routinely, yeah, everybody would see it right away. It's part of their worldview that, yeah, there's a lot of femicide going on, millions of women, right? But we talk about homicide, genocide, but we should talk about femicide or gynocide. Um, let's see, women do all this work, right? Food, water, fuel, handcrafts, and they don't get paid for it, right? Double shift. Um, okay, so all that stuff are problems. Um, okay, so um, I guess that's enough on that. So let's go back to the previous day, back to our humanism. And um, let me see, I have my list of students who said they weren't yet ready, but I think, uh, you know, I told them I would um, call on them now. But if you remember, one of the main themes in this lecture was about the importance of having a philosophy. So, so what, what you need to think about, you know, in these, these two lectures is humanism and then uh, the capabilities model as one kind of humanism, and yet how that can get distorted when it comes to actually trying to make the world uh, more humanistic and less gendered. Um, let's see, and then the definition is the focus on reason and as opposed to faith or fatalism or all these other things, the USA was originally the original humanistic country. And now we are definitely not, like we have totally changed. We have more people who separate reason from faith and who are basically think human beings are born sinners. And that's not humanism, right? Humanism is you're either born neither good nor evil, or you're born children naturally want to be good, but they can get crippled by culture. So, you know, humanists tend to either think it's natural to want to help other people out. It's natural. Children naturally think in the golden rule unless you, unless you corrupt them, um, or they're born neither, right? But to say that someone's born a sinner and they can't become good without the grace of God, that is an anti-humanistic kind of religion. And it splits reason and faith. And America used to be the most humanistic. And now I think it has probably the highest percentage, a really high percentage. More than half Americans are anti-humanist which is pretty scary. <laughs> um, there's academic, right? So like May Wish said, right? They just sit in their offices and spin out these theories, but they're detached from the rest of humanity. So um, 
Then there was uh, communism and socialism also wants to develop humanity, but they got all caught up in the economic systems, right? So then besides just theories about human nature, what about politics and economics? Um, all right, then we had the manifesto and the, the thing there was what did they focus on in 1933? And they had religious humanism, spiritual humanism. What did they focus on in 1973? Now you have more related to technology, uh, environmental degradation, uh, nuclear war, uh, scientific method. Um, and again, they're not totally ruling out religion, but they, you know, the more science and technology we have, the more we need a new view of religion, right? We've got to change the paradigm. Um, we shouldn't worry about a future life. We need to worry about this life. We shouldn't believe in capitalism or communism. We need to come up with solutions to problems, right? Like Maywish says, it's not, don't go with, you know, government is always bad. Government is always good. Forget it. Just figure out, you know, what are we supposed to do in this situation? Ethics is, is situational, right? People make choices. How do you make sure you make better choices? Commercialization is bad and dehumanizing. Uh, reason are, and intelligence are good. Um, let's see. Sexuality, okay, here we get so much of this in the US anyway, people get fixated on abortion, for example. None of these other things matter, right? Nothing else matters, which is crazy, right? And so civil liberties matter, a free and open society matters, separating church and state matters. Um, all right, and then, um, Cooperative planning, blah, blah, blah. So there's lots of stuff there that any of you could respond to. But the, the thing I wanted to point out was this 2000, uh, this is a secular humanist document and it is, it's, um, it's heritage traces back to Greece and Rome, China, whatever, India. And it's based on naturalism. And it's a lot more anti-religious, okay? That most worldviews accepted today are spiritual, mystical, or theological. They have their origins in ancient, pre-urban, nomadic, agricultural societies of the past, not in the modern industrial, post-industrial, uh, global information culture, right? So... It's up to each of you to decide, you know, how much you think religion is just outdated and it's just keeping us down and how much you think it can be still used in spite of all the changes in technology. Um, that's up to you. Um, ethics and reason. Um, humanity. So it's becoming more and more global, obviously, a planetary humanism. It's becoming more and more environmental also. Um, it includes the United Nations. Um, and then it recommends new institutions. So, all right. And it always advocates optimism. So who have we got here that didn't talk? So Aurora is not here. Um, what about um, Jana Tool? I don't think you talked last time. Did you want to talk this time? About yesterday, last time's um, lecture? If you do, you can put it in the chat. Um, Supti, are you there? I don't see her. Um, Fatima, are you there? Wow, all these people have left. <laughs> um, again, I don't know if, if your machine broke down, 
fine. But if, you know, you check out after an hour and a half, uh, that's, you need to let me know because that's not attending the class, all right? Um, let's see. Uh, Isabel, do you want to talk about last time's lecture? Are you there? Isabel? Oh, not now. Okay. Uh, Rita, are you there? Okay. Aisha? My goodness, there's a lot of people gone, right? Okay, you want to talk, Aisha? I don't see her. Okay, Aisha. Oh, okay, she did talk. In, okay. Um, anybody else want to talk about the material from last time? Oh, here's the chat. Um, Professor, you mean the humanism one that we were assigned to in the last class? Yeah, I just had listed that not that many people actually spoke last time. And I think I told them I would come back to them. That's all. Um, Pooja, I don't have you down. Did you speak last time? Yeah, Professor, I did. Okay. Oh, you know what? Well, let's see. All right. Okay. Um, because then I'll... Anybody else want to speak about last time, the humanism? Because then I'll go back. Oh, yeah? Yeah, Professor, I have already taught, talk about the last class human, humanism about religion, but I'm interested with uh, military humanism and there I haven't found information yet. I just found only a little bit. Uh, is that about the military is they have a humanization about uh, like force each other uh, like how to say it, it is like a hard work you have to participate as a military so is there a real or an irreal I don't know I still have no idea but I think it is right because in the real world, in our country, we have seen it is a real humanism, like uh, the military are, because um, most of the military, when they attend, when they enter to the military camp, they have to be very strong, and then if they they are not following the route, they will be punishment so hard, and that they will have to live a strong life, and then. If something wrong, they had to be go to the punishment wing and then without any re, 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 to say, excuse. So yeah, it, it make me stressed if we compare, we compare to the other humanisms because like religious humanism, we had to love each other and they're like, uh, God wants us to love each other, follow what God sees and do a good day. And then for the, democracy, humanism, there was a freedom for us and then we can stay freely with our uh, freedom. So uh, for the military is uh, very different because you have to live uh, like a strong life and then if something wrong, you will be punished directly. Yeah. You, so I, I will, if you have a letter for that, I will want to read more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, actually, I, I just saw that I had written down, I was gonna send you just war theory. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Professor. But I forgot, so I'm gonna have to do that. But um, that is a good case of where the theory sounds good, but the reality is so different. So um, I know that there are lots of countries and Israel is one of them, but I'm sure it's not the only one where you're required to do military service. And in that, during that time, 
You just have to make a total commitment to defend your country no matter what, right? And um, so, of course, that's going to create a lot of problems. <laughs> and military life in general is very authoritarian because if you're in the middle of a war and your sergeant or whatever it is, lieutenant, whatever, tells you, you got to run down this hill and you got to shoot these people. You're not going to sit back and go, well, I have to think about that. Like, I'm not quite sure that I believe in killing or I'm not quite sure that, you know, that I think this is the best strategy. I mean, you just have to do it because it's uh, you're everyone's in survival mode. So, yeah, war is inherently anti-democratic internally, much less in your relationship to uh, the other country, right? You've given up diplomacy, you've given up any kind of reasoning, and now it's war. And so that's, that's a huge problem. The, the, the thing about just war theory, I would say it still isn't useless because you do have to have a list of stuff to prevent brutality or to call out brutality and say, no, it's wrong. You can't say war is, is bad, right? War is just war, that's the way it is. You can say you didn't have to massacre these people. You didn't have to say we take no prisoners, right? You don't have to treat prisoners this way. It doesn't solve the problem. It just creates a desire for revenge. So if you are too extreme in the way you conduct a war, you just trigger a revenge response. And even if you win, the people hate you so much that they'll come back after you at the first chance they get. So that would be the usefulness of just war theory. It's not to live a pie in the sky world. Um, and the other thing is, um, when, when there is that problem with militarism. Now the US is, makes billions of bucks. The US corporations make billions of dollars selling weapons to countries in Africa and other countries where they then use those weapons to um, you know, have civil wars or social unrest and keep those countries at a, at a very, terrorized level um, of, of breakdown in civilization. So I don't think the US even looks good anymore, but even if we looked good, underneath that is all the ways we profit on these civil wars in these other countries. And we shouldn't be supplying them with weapons. And our government doesn't. I don't think it's our government, it's our corporations. And there's no limits put on free enterprise, right? It's called freedom, free enterprise. And uh, it just means the freedom to sell weapons to people who then brutalize each other. So, so do you think now that some of the weapons people in your country use are actually bought from US corporations? Mm, Professor, I don't really know, but I heard it's from China. Yes. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's why we hate China sometimes. <laughs> Is anybody in this class from China? I, I, I did ask. I don't think so because we have just a few Chinese students, right? And then I have saw her in other class. Yeah. I think, I think they are here. in economic department. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I saw her in economic class. Well, I asked because I thought the first time I was here, I did have a student from China. And another student used an example of a, of a Athena kind of woman, a lover of justice woman, who was a leader in the Hong Kong um, response. And the, the Chinese student I had, <laughs> uh, she didn't like that. So, um, 
So I understand now that China is more of the, the bugaboo in a lot of uh, the students' minds than the U.S. is, which is interesting because for many years, the U.S. was very blatantly going into South America, Central America during the Cold War. And they just, it wasn't hard to call us anti-democratic. Um, and it still isn't, frankly, we still have all these wars for oil, but I think uh, the countries where a lot of the students come from now, China is getting to be a more immediate threat right now. So, so they get their weapons from China rather than from the US. So that's, that's interesting. But in spite of all of that is what I'm kind of getting at that still all of you, you know, can work for the improvement of women's situation for the next 50 years, right? There's, you can find a door that'll open for you in spite of everything else that goes on. So you don't wanna be pie in the sky. You don't wanna uh, ignore, deny, whatever, all the other problems environmental problems, war, wars for resources, wars for oil, air pollution. There's all sorts of stuff, but I still think each of you can find some, a way to make a meaningful contribution and to live uh, a pretty amazing life and to have pretty amazing friends that encourage each other, right? So in your effort to develop a healthy psyche, I think, you know, you do need to find something meaningful to do and some friends and some support networks. Um, rather than, uh, you know, I mean, you again, do you think it's a healthier psyche to just ignore stuff or just give up, right? Or just settle for something? Um, and you can, I, you know, in your papers, you can say, okay, um, I think that in a healthy psyche for me, right, I'm just going to accept this because I can't fight everything, but I'm going to focus on this because I think it's healthier and it's healthier for me. So your final papers can be um, either general, right? A healthy psyche is one where the capabilities are developing and you have access and opportunity um, but it can be more specific right in my case because of this and that this is where I think I want to go in terms of cultivating a healthy psyche right um, let's see does that make sense to people any questions about that because I do have this one more thing to do um, and the one more thing was to go back to, I'm going to go back to the syllabus actually. And, um, think out loud about the theme for today is how, what appears to be good right? Humanism, the capabilities model, Aristotle's virtues, ended up being bad, <laughs> ended up with colonialism. Um, so let's look at all of these and think about, well, it looked good. How could it get corrupted by patriarchy, right? And so I'm going to just speculate, or I'm going to give these ideas about answering the question. But when I'm done, I want each of you to pick out one thing, either that I said or I didn't say that you thought of, and then the class will be over. But I want you to think about how something can sound good and it turns out it's not, or it gets misunderstood or misapplied because I don't want you to get too discouraged, right? So if you can anticipate that this is gonna happen, it won't bother you so much. Um, all right, so Aristotle's model might sound good, 
but Aristotle himself was sexist. Um, colonialism involved using Aristotle as a bludgeon to say that's why we're superior, we have more practical wisdom. Okay, well, lesson learned. We don't do that anymore. And then all of a sudden, oh my gosh, women are still doing it. Uh, you know, colonialism. And now it's feminist Western women who are using Aristotle to promote colonialism, right? I mean, we knew Aristotle did that because he's in a sexist SOB and we know these guys in the past did it. Okay, but we're not gonna do it anymore. Well, lo and behold, we do. So we gotta relook at that. What about Seneca? Well, when he's writing his letter to his friend, it presupposes a whole lot of privilege, right? He's saying, well, how much of a public life and how much of a private life and you have to have a balance. Well, most women don't get to choose those things, right? They don't get to decide, am I going to take on a leadership position in political life or am I going to be a college professor? You know, <laughs> they don't have choices like that. So again, that letter was written uh, between uh, privileged males, right? Privileged white males. So it would have to be completely, you know, revamped. And uh, yeah, when I told you all to write a letter to a friend, of course, you didn't even think about, I don't think the bias of the original text, you just thought, well, how would it apply to my life? And also a lot of you said, well, I already write letters or I already have these conversations. So it's the, the language itself, the concepts aren't necessarily gender, class, race, but they have been in the past and they still could be, and you have to watch out for it. Um, Augustine, so his idea, uh, a number of you liked it, fine. Uh, the notion of using math to think about eternal truth and temporal. Well, Augustine himself associated women with the temporal and not being fully rational. So women came out as the temptress, you know, evil. They represent lust. And so Augustine was pretty down on women, Augustine himself. But just the view of eternal truth versus temporal truth does uh, detach people from any kind of context, cultural context, you know, all the kinds of stuff we're talking about today. It's a disembodied point of view. It, and so usually women come out behind when you have a point of view that that's, that's that abstract, because women tend to be crippled more by particular circumstances than men are. And Augustine himself lived a very privileged life as a monk in a monastery, right? Writing stuff <laughs> or a bishop, but he was, you know, he was protected. He had privilege. Um, Okay, then there was St. Thomas and the union of Aristotle with the Catholic Church. That's when I brought in Pope Francis and that's when I brought in Martin Luther King. So that's when Pope Francis is against religious bigotry. If you go back over that list, it's all good stuff, but it doesn't talk about women very much. And Pope Francis actually thought, uh, the, the irony about the Pope is that he'll say, no, women, women, he'll, he'll even say women are better than men because they are concrete. Like they understand that these theories have to be realized in daily life, which is great. I agree with Pope Francis, but he also, the, the official Catholic position is no birth control, no abortion, uh, you know. So yeah, it's great to have women participate in, in social and political life, but you know, 
they could have unplanned pregnancies and setbacks and never get, you know, get the education or the job. But, you know, it's too bad. <laughs> so he doesn't, he does, he says women are better at contextualizing, but Francis himself doesn't contextualize when he says, you know, you can't use birth control. So that's ironic. Like he's acting like the very typical men that he, he, he criticizes. Um, so that, that would be the thing I'd say there. Then Martin Luther King talked about race. And um, he himself, Martin Luther King, had woman problems. <laughs> but again, it wasn't the issues there at that time in the 60s. There was a feminist movement, but it was a different movement than the race. Um, they're connected. But again, there's just a different emphasis there. Then there was utilitarianism, pleasure, pain, and happiness. Now, now you look through the lens of gender and how much of what people consider pleasure, pain, and happiness is gendered. Um, how much, you know, if a woman says, well, I like to get up and put on makeup and, and care about my looks because it makes me happy, right? And it doesn't have anything to do with the male gaze, right? Trying, trying to get male approval. But maybe it does, right? So there is, you do need to re-look at these things. What does make me happy or not? Not only do you have to examine, do I care more about wealth or power or status, or do I care about flourishing? You also have to think about how much of your ideas are really gendered, and they are about getting male approval, about um, having adapted to a patriarchy to a greater extent than you've thought, than you've realized before. So, um, so there's that, then there's a free and open society, but that only applies to mature adults. Well, in the past, mature adults that seek higher pleasures, well, women weren't given the opportunity for higher pleasures. So that was a big problem. But, you know, later on you find out Mill understood all these problems. It's just that Bentham didn't. And when Bentham says, you should pursue whatever you want as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else, I think Bentham could have been pretty ignorant of how much in the society was actually hurting women that he was not aware of. Um, all right, and then Hedges points out about how greed corrupts our notions of pleasure, pain, and happiness. But patriarchy also does, and racism does. Um, then there's Kant. That's another good example of a disembodied mind, right? It might sound good in theory, you know, do your duty, follow the moral law. But in a particular circumstance, or in the way that the culture runs, if it's a patriarchal culture, does it, is it generally the case? that men and women's ideas of what your duty is and how to act um, is, is gendered, it's different. So if a man thinks um, everybody should, you know, to do your duty means what? Never to tell a lie, never to, oh, okay. So Kant says you can't will not to develop your talents, right? But the example he uses is laziness would be the cause. So you know, that's a red flag. For a woman, she fails to develop her talents, but it's not because of laziness. Um, and then Kant himself was flat out sexist. He truly said that women are not capable of emotionally detached thinking. 
he thought they're not capable of thinking in principles. And so he said, they're wonderful. The difference between um, beauty and I can't remember his distinction, the sublime and the something else. But I mean, he truly said women basically are fundamentally different from men, even though they belong to the same species. But all right, I hope you understand that, that men is, Kant is overtly sexist. Other people could say, oh, no, you can use Kant in a way that's not sexist. And yet, if you look at a woman's life and the kind of decision she makes and the, you know, what it means to follow the moral law and um, things like, you know, developing your talents, obviously, gender is a huge issue when you start thinking about how these moral lives play out in the people's lives. Then relativism. Um, and that was where Ruth Benedict was insisting on relativism, except that if whatever a culture selects for, um, good and evil is just a term for socially approved habits, Sexism is obviously good because sexism was socially approved in virtually every society. Of course, Benedict doesn't believe that because she fought against the sexism in her own society. She was maladaptive in her society. She was way ahead of her time. But, you know, so on my criteria, right, she was cultivating her capabilities to a higher level and good for her. On her criteria, she wasn't well integrated. She needed to be socialized better. So that's a problem. Um, in that paper I wrote, I only had you read the first 14 pages, but later on in the paper, I do bring that up if you ever wanna look at that. Um, those of you who haven't written your first paper, if you want to write your final paper, um, what the assignment is 1500 words. You could write it 2500 words if you want to. Um, at this point, you just have to decide what to do, but the word count is the word count. And I can be flexible in a lot of ways, but you'll have to talk to me about that. Then there is um, the UN model and capabilities. That was where I gave that paper, where I was supporting the capabilities model but I wasn't mentioning the things that we talked about today. So that's a really good example of how something might seem good. And then when women actually go out and try to do it. Now, I myself don't think that if I had gone to a developing country and tried to you know, promote capabilities, I don't think I would have done it the way these women did. Um, but, um, they still did racism. And so we did start talking about Sojourner Truth ran into sexism as well as racism. Um, and Frederick Douglass didn't run into sexism that much, but racism. So Sojourner, remember, she got pregnant and she was so happy that she was cranking out babies for her master because it was making him wealthier. <laughs> and Frederick Douglass didn't have that problem. So there's lots of gendered stuff. Frederick Douglass said that his mother was ripped away from him and that slavery, you know, separates mothers from their children, which is really gross and disgusting. Um, so racism, you know, it's just perverted. And I can't imagine anybody, nobody is really a moral relativist. They'll say they are, but I don't think they are. Um, and then the thing about Muslim women to, and education is the key out, even though it means they're not socialized because they're obviously not socialized. Um, and then the question is whether the future, uh, and those of you who, who and uh, don't, who like Islam and it's not inconsistent with feminism to you, you can write that statement in your final paper. Um, 
okay. And then the humanism. And then I skipped this one. I've changed it up a little bit. So I, the July 11th was July 4th. And then we're going to do this one next time. Now, the thing we're doing for next time is different because we're going back to science. And um, we've been focused on culture a lot. But the point I wanted to make here is that the paradigm shift is a shift in science as well as culture. They're interconnected. So, so scientific method led to these two views of reason. The utilitarianism was based on um, scientific method that's data, data based. And Kant's view was based on the notion of scientific laws. Both of those. Um, paradigms have been rejected. The Enlightenment paradigm has been rejected in favor of systems thinking. And so then the, you need to change up your humanism. And so I quote from a number of different authors about what the new paradigm means for um, science, social science, and culture. Now, this paper is long. You don't have to read the whole thing, just skim it. I would say read the first part because those are new thinkers, Whitehead, Laszlo, and um, there's one more. And then the second part is Aristotle's virtues. So you, you, could, you should be able to sort of eyeball that and get that. But I do want you to know that I am shifting it up right here toward the end so that you get this idea that um, science is changing also. And then, um, so we have one day on just in general science systems thinking, and then we're gonna have three days on um, neuroscience. Neuroscience is big, like huge investments. And this is sort of cutting edge, um, psychology. So the neuroscience discoveries have rejected empiricism and dualism. So they reject the enlightenment. But then this guy introduces what neuroscience teaches us. And I was reading his book and I said, my gosh, that's the Greek culture. Don't you know that, right? People are so uneducated. Smart people can be really stupid, okay, because they're over specialized. And I hope you also say they didn't get a liberal arts education. They just went to university and started specializing right away. And so they really don't know a whole lot of stuff. And so I will just assign excerpts, certain chapters from my book. And you do have research papers at some point. Again, I'm giving you a, a deadline of August 25th for both the papers and everything, but I would not advise waiting, you know? So you have, um, I, I mean, not August 25th, July. So today's July, what, third, fourth, sorry, where you live. Um, so you've got 20 days, about three weeks, and just pace yourself. That's what I would say. Pace yourself and meet with me if you need to. I required conferences, but nobody's coming. So I, I think you write a better paper and it takes you less time if you have a conference. But I'm, you know, I'm not going to force it. I'm not going to count off points. It's up to you. Um, and then the last week of class, the first day I do want to meet and the first day talking about Aristotle's virtues today in a post-COVID world just to help you with your final papers and then the last day um, just talking about your outlines actually the first day would be your out your your research papers like what you said and then the second day is your final papers and mostly it's just for everyone to present what they've got. Um, and I think I'll probably start those classes later. They'll just be hour and a half. 
or two hour classes. I know that a lot of teachers don't meet class at all that last week, but I'm just gonna meet you to talk about your stuff. I think it will help you write a better paper. I hope I'd like you to ask your fellow students questions so that help them write better papers and also just oral communication skills. Okay, Diana, go ahead. Officer, I have a confusion which is not clear for me. And that is that if we are writing the first letter for a friend or for ourselves, then do we need to do the rest of the two fine and the two of the papers or no? Well, we need to yeah. do only one. Well, if the post, right? If you're doing it for that one post, then you have to do both of them. If you're doing it for uh, one of your papers, it's just one paper. If the letter to a friend is 2,500 words long, right? Mm -hmm. Then you can count for both papers, right? Okay. And it might be an easy way to write a longer paper because you would just, if you wanted to write a letter to a friend and go through every Aristotelian virtue, I think you could get a, a long paper and it's something we've been talking about and it could count as both papers if you if it's long enough and you know, you'd have it done, no problem, right? But if you're tired, if you're tired of talking about that because we've already done that, you know that stuff and you wanna actually explore something new or something else that really grabbed you, right? I want something, you're writing yourself a book. Something okay. grabs you, something you want to know about. Okay, does that answer your question? Yes, Professor, thank you. Sure. All right. Uh, okay, I'm going to call on everybody. They get one, one minute, two minutes. Anything that struck you that you hadn't thought about the first time about patriarchy? Um, Diana. Sorry, Professor. I just, I told you I would ask you what struck you the most about what I said in terms of, you know, something like, I liked Kant. I didn't know he was so sexist, right? Um, just something that I said that would cause you to rethink, right? Because the mm -hmm. lesson for today was humanism sounds great. And all of a sudden, whoops, right? So is there yeah. anything I said that you, ha you had one of those whoops moments? <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't remember that, Professor, that I don't know that what came to my mind. Okay. What about Isabel? Anything come to your mind? Um, do you mean about um, patriarchal staffs? Right. I mean, the first time we went through it, I didn't talk about patriarchy very much, right? This time I did. Was there anyone that, that occurred to you, right, the way you thought about it the first time and then today? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I... Okay. Okay. Oh. I'll move on for a minute. Um, I'm always just thinking. Uh, like uh, something that uh, stuck in my mind also, it was like the practical wisdom. Like I was shocked to, like when you said that um, Aristotle, right, is sexist or, yes. Yeah, so yeah, we have, we face a lot of like this, like maybe political leaders or anyone who, you know, show that um, they are more virtuous. And at the end, like you found out, oh no, that um, yeah, like their wisdom lacks something. So. Uh, okay. I'd like to read more and discover why he's uh, sexist or, yeah. Well, you know, I think he would actually change his mind by now because he was very cutting edge, right? So yeah. it's, 
it's it's not as if he would have been stubborn. It's amazing how the scholars are fundamentalists. I mean, they just take Aristotle literally when Aristotle himself would not take himself literally, right? It's, <laughs> these are his student notes. So the question is whether his view is irredeemably sexist, like you could not have a non-sexist view of the virtues, right? Or a non-class based. For example, with eating, don't eat too much, too little, eat the right things, blah, blah. Well, that supposes you have enough money and time, right? Which very few people have. And so, yeah, you could say there's a bias in that in terms of uh, class, even if a, it might not be gender or if the boy child or the man in the family gets the better food than the woman, it's not her fault, right? And then she gets not healthy because she's not eating right. Yeah. <laughs> so you could picture ways that the traditional virtues could be uh, corrupted, right? Yeah, okay. Or women get accused of being too fearful. Well, they have a lot more to be afraid of, <laughs> right? It might be appropriate for a woman to be afraid of things a man isn't afraid of, right? Um, yeah. Okay, so Ashlyn, did you think of something? Uh, Professor, so what uh, I also thought is something related to uh, what Amal and you have discussed it right now. So initially, when we were going through the Aristotle's virtue, what I have made a note is like it, those virtues are helping us to maximize the flourishing thing. So when we once read it, like uh, once go through all the virtues, it would be like, yeah, it, 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 it actually works good. And if we apply it to our uh, day, daily life, it would be good. But when we started thinking and or when you itself started thinking from uh, talking from a very, you know, counter side of it. Yeah, that's when I started thinking, uh, OK, how these virtues or virtues in general, not only Aristotle's can manipulate people. Uh, to a certain level and they can corrupt it. So we must be very critical in thinking how virtues, yeah, because it's just a point of view of a single person, right? So we have to think it from multiple dimensions to not get corrupted. So right. that's what, yeah. Good, that's good. Especially like fear, right? What men fear, what women fear, what women have to fear, right? Versus what men have. My gosh, and it like it shouldn't be. Women shouldn't have to be afraid of going out at night. And, you know, the people who are protecting them from themselves or something. I mean, all that stuff is so screwed up because of patriarchy, right? Exactly. So, yeah, you can do a whole analysis of, yeah, fear, we're vulnerable. That sounds good. And that sounds universal. But when it comes <laughs> to the daily day of situations, all of a sudden it gets really complicated. But still women have to be courageous. It's just what they have to be courageous about. And, you know, stuff like that is gonna be different. Um, okay, now, can you think of something? No, really, Professor. That's okay. Did something at some point when I said it, made you rethink what you had thought the first time? I don't know if she's there. Uh, Jana Tool, are you there? Okay, Ritika? Aisha? No new things, okay. As long as we can consider everything justly, supporters get questioned. Okay. Superficially, figuratively equal scenarios are not enough to find a solution, right? That's true um, for ensuring. Um, yeah. Yeah, Ratika, Martin Luther King did have this problem. <laughs> and 
it's frustrating because there are plenty of other people like John Lewis who did all the same things and didn't have woman problems, but he's not the famous one, you know? So it should go beyond, it's about racism. Anyway, um, those are long stories and they're frustrating stories. So um, I'm gonna let you go so that you, you at least have 15 minutes to work on your reflections. And then we shall come back in a couple days and we have the systems thinking. So just give me an hour and a half, you know, read it for an hour and a half or two hours. And however far you get is how far you get. Um, okay. I'll stay here if anybody has more questions. Thank you, Professor. Hi, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Have a good day, Professor. Yeah, you have a good day, guys. Thank you. Oh, I better turn this off. Okay.